Hello, I'm Izzy Gibson, and I am joined by Sir Mark Lyle Grant here at RAW 12.51 a.m. Sir Mark's career has spanned four decades in the diplomatic service. Most notably, he spent six years as a permanent representative to the United Nations and as national security advisor between 2015 and 2017. Thank you for joining me. Pleasure, Izzy. To start, what would you argue is the biggest threat to UK's national security right now? I think there are four major threats. There's a state-based threat, the resurgent Russia, which is threatening some of our uh, allies and testing our sea and air defences on a daily basis. There's a counter-terrorist uh, threat, an extremism, particularly from Islamist extremism, which has increased significantly in recent years. There's a cyber threat, which has become an increasing concern, both for government and businesses, and indeed individuals. And then there's the threat of the erosion of the rules-based international order, which was built up after the Second World War and is so essential to British security. Awesome. You have said in the past that Brexit is not as much of a security threat as some has, have made us to believe, but does it have any threats and what are they if there is? I don't think there are any direct negative implications for our national security because our national security does not depend on our membership of the European Union. Our membership of NATO, the Five Eyes Intelligence Community, our permanent membership of the UN Security Council, our bilateral relations with France and other European countries, all of those are more important than membership of the European Union per se for our national security. But there are certain implications that we are going to need to negotiate um, during the Brexit negotiations. Probably the most important of that is some of the information sharing systems which are owned by the European Union, in a sense, like Europol or the Schengen Information System, the Advanced Passenger Information Record System. All those are very valuable for tackling serious and organized crime, but also uh, counter-terrorism efforts. And we will need to negotiate access to those databases even after we leave the European Union. There's a second problem, which is Northern Ireland, on the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. At the moment, that border is completely uh, permeable. Um, and we want it to remain so, but nonetheless, we need to find a technical solution which allows uh, the United Kingdom to be outside the single market and outside the customs union, whilst still not having fixed border points all along that, uh, that border in, in Ireland. So that's an important issue. The third issue is probably um, our participation in some of the European foreign and security policy and defence policy issues. At the moment we participate in anti-piracy in the Red Sea, anti-immigration in the Mediterranean, etc. And the question is, do we want to continue to participate in those European ventures even though we will not have a say in setting them up after we leave the European Union. Do you think we should have a part in those ventures personally, or do you think we should leave them alone? I think we should. I mean, they're all open to third party members. For instance, Turkey is part of the um, effort in Bosnia to, to have greater stability in Bosnia. But um, it is difficult because I think ministers are going to be very reluctant to participate in missions that they don't have any say over setting up in the first place. And so we need to find some arrangement to uh, bridge that gap. Perfect. Um, President Trump is known for his rash approaches to foreign policy. Is there any way that these could have a negative effect on UK's foreign affairs? I, I think it's important not to underestimate the depth of the special relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. I mean, it is very, very deep across intelligence, defense, security. It goes well beyond individual presidents or individual prime ministers. And that hasn't really been affected uh, in any way at all by, by the election of President Trump. And indeed, many of the things he said during his election campaign haven't actually transpired um, as American uh, policy. I think the area I would be most concerned about is perhaps his approach on some of the multilateral issues, um, such as climate change, free trade, the Iran nuclear deal, issues like that, where um, if America pulls out of those arrangements, um, then it will weaken the international system, which, as I mentioned at the, the start, is one of the important aspects of British national security. Um, 
Do you have confidence in Theresa May's current government in dealing with issues of national security? I know you were in her government for a little bit, but now out of it, do you still have faith in her? Oh yes. I mean, uh, she comes from a national security background, if you like. She was five years in the, in the Home Office, so understands many of the issues of national security extremely well. Um, what's new for her is some of the more foreign uh, policy aspects. Um, but the policies that my successor is pursuing as National Security Advisor are very similar to the ones that I was when I was there. Perfect. Um, in your final closing remarks at the UN, you said that your biggest regret was your inability to end the humanitarian catastrophe of ISIL. Looking back, actually looking at ISIL now, do you think that the situation is getting better? I think the situation in Syria um, is better but extremely complicated and could again get worse. Um, it's become a very mixed picture in Syria where a lot of different erstwhile allies are fighting each other um, and the government has no control. And some of the external actors like Turkey, like Iran, uh, like Russia are dictating terms um, but are not united themselves on the way forward. So I think it'll be many, many years before Syria can be put back together, if you like, as a single stable state. What about the issue of the um, ISIL affiliates that have seemed to have been popping up around the rest of the global stage, such as in the UK on a couple occasions? Yeah, that is a concern. I mean, obviously the caliphate, the dream of a caliphate is, is dead. Um, ISIS has been beaten on the battlefields of Syria. Uh, and Iraq, but they still pose a threat through some of their affiliates, as you mentioned. We've seen just in recent days what's happened in Afghanistan, where there's an ISIS operations there. Uh, we've seen it in Libya uh, as well. But more seriously for the United Kingdom, even than that, is their uh, radicalization of some of the young Muslim communities in the UK, where they are encouraging British nationals to go out and attack people uh, in the streets. Mm. Continuing on with the theme of the United Nations, there's been a lot of criticism posed against it, especially concerning the Security Council. As someone that has experienced the institution firsthand, do you feel as though any reforms could possibly take place to make the UN a better, more effective body? I think criticism of the UN is a bit unfair because the UN is not like the European Union. It doesn't have any legal personality of its own. It is an intergovernmental body. And the failures of the UN are therefore really the failures of the member states. And it is when uh, the United States and Russia and China, for instance, disagree that problems don't get solved. So I think one has to put the blame where it's due on some of the big member states who haven't been able to come together to resolve some of the conflicts and some of the problems uh, of the world. Would reform uh, change that? I don't think it would, to be honest. I think we should reform the Security Council because it's not reflecting today's reality and there are some countries that should be permanent members of the Security Council, but it would be a mistake to think that will actually make resolution of the problems that exist at the moment easier. I don't think it will. Mm. So one of the big issues within the Security Council is obviously member states abusing their veto powers. You were president of the uh, Security Council on multiple occasions during those periods or in your Security Council time as a whole. Did you ever see any um, member states abuse their veto power? Oh yes, I mean Russia vetoed four resolutions on uh, Syria uh, while I was there. Um, all of which, had those resolutions been adopted and Russia not vetoed them, could have put an end to the bloodshed in Syria um, several years ago, particularly at the beginning in 2011-2012, when there was an opportunity to stop Assad killing the demonstrators against him. Um, that could have changed the whole um, sort of context of that conflict. So yes, one has to put a lot of blame on Russia for having vetoed those resolutions. Um, how did the Iraq and Afghan war affect your time as High Commissioner to Pakistan, if it did at all? I don't think it did hugely. Um, one of the interesting things about the approach of Pakistan was that uh, they had, although they had two major conflicts, if you like, on their borders, one in Afghanistan, uh, one in uh, Kashmir, um, the biggest issue for many Pakistani people was the, was the plight of the Palestinians. Uh, and it was the Arab-Palestine issue that had more resonance uh, there than uh, 
the Iraq war, for instance. And finally, what would you say was your biggest diplomatic achievement in your nearly four decades in the foreign, foreign service? Well, I'd like to think there were, there were plenty, but one that gives me particular pleasure was um, successfully preventing a British national called Tahir Hussain from being executed on death row in Pakistan and then securing his release because um, his imprisonment for 28 years was, was unfounded um, and uh, it was great that we finally managed to get him released very shortly before I left Pakistan and I'm very proud of that. Thank you. This has been Sir Mark Lyle Grant. Thank you very much. Thank you.